Ray Galton and Alan Simpson were introduced to each other by TB, meeting while being treated for the lung disease that in the era before antibiotics was a plague to generations. But their names remain linked by TV. After meeting the comedian Tony Hancock while writing for radio in the 1950s, they suggested a 30-minute television show for the performer, which became Hancock's Half Hour, its catchphrases still quoted today. The writing duo then created a remarkable on-screen double act in the rag and bone sitcom Steptoe and Son. Gordon and Simpson have not written together for 30 years, but DVD and repeat channels have made their work some of the longest lasting half hours in entertainment history. Like Marks and Spencer, Gilbert and Sullivan, Morgan and Wise, you get bracketed together always with, with that and between you. Has that ever annoyed either of you? Uh, has it? Well, no, not to my, not to my. No, we started off as Simpson and Gorton, um, and then some, I don't know, about, about sixty something, we suddenly became Gorton and Simpson, which I think my mother we... objected. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, but, but uh, uh, they sometimes they left the uh, O in off the uh, my name, so uh, Ray Galt and Alan Simpson. Yeah, Ray Galt and Alan. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> right, yeah. And then we've be, we've been Ray Ganley. Alan Simple. Um, <laughs> Simpleton. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've got various. Uh, you know, but we did a we did a show with Hancock where where um, we, we always used to get his name wrong. You know, he, 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 the local paper would be Tony Hankick or uh, you know, to, you know to, Tony Hand, Hand, Handbag. You know, so, so always just get his name wrong. And it's one of those uh, strange things. It's a generalisation that's true that serious drama has tended to be written by one person and comedy has pretty much always been written by two people, by duos. Why, why do you think that is? You need a, a, a sounding board, really, uh, where, you know, where it's funny. But when, when we uh, all worked together in one building, uh, Spike Milligan and Eric Sykes, Alan and myself, we found that uh, Spike would come in quite often into our room and say, oh, listen to this, you must hear this. And, uh, no, no. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? And Eric would occasionally as well. But we never did that to them because, you know, we would do it to each other. Well, I was going to say, it was the joke has two parts, hasn't it? It has the setup and the punchline, and presumably that's, that's why two people writing together. Well, you, you, you do become a bit... Um, a, a, a bit uh... What's the um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Where you finish each other's sentences. We used to get a lot of that, you know. Annoying. Yeah, that's annoying. The, <laughs> that's it. Um, Lawrence Marks and Morris Grant, who wrote Birds of a Feather and many other comedies, they once told me that a writing partnership is like a marriage. You shout at each other all the time, and you don't have sex. Do you recognise that description of a writing partnership? Uh, well, I better not say it's the other way around with us, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I tell you, you spend more, spend time, more writing. time. Yeah, exactly. More time uh, uh, with Alan and I in each other's company. I spent more time than we ever did with our wives, probably. Uh, not so nice in one way or other, but uh, uh, yeah, that's the way you really get to know a person. And the, the idea of finishing sentences and having the same thoughts occurs all the time between us. The uh, the. Um... The thing about you know, we were slow writers, you know, basically, and uh, that's why it took, used to take so long. That's why we spent so much time in each other's company. Some writers knock it off, you know. Writers who've had journalistic backgrounds write very quickly. You know, it's like the, the, in, in being a journalist, they say, I want 500 words now about something, and they just do it. You know? Well, we could never do that. We have to sit and think all day long, and, you know, sometimes we go three days without writing a word. We used to take a run of to suggest something, and the other one said nothing, and many didn't like it. <coughs> and then we'd ne all day ago by without any, you know, because, and we'd found out three days later that we'd forgotten whose turn it was to say something. <laughs> this is when you get to hate each other, yeah, <laughs> slightly. But, um, well, no, but that's an important point because it is the question that double acts are always asked, whether they're writers or performers, is whether you have ever ended up hating each other. No, not on, not no, 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 not uh, no, no. It's no, not no, worth no, the no, trouble. No, no. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> no. It, you know, so it, it, it'd be impossible to to work under those conditions. I mean, the way Gilbert and Sullivan are supposed to have worked, that would be impossible, wouldn't it? Where they didn't yeah, speak. Yeah, they didn't speak, yeah. and they, one of them wrote the words and stuck it under the door, and that <laughs> nah, you couldn't. Well, I mean, I can't. Yeah, you have know, half a sentence, and and you have to stick it under the door for me to write the other half. No, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. I I, I find Alan. Tolerance of my moods and uh, and 
uh, absences from <laughs> from the writing table. <laughs> quite quite incredible. I would have gone absolutely bananas, <laughs> ballistics. But I would go out and not return and things like that for hours sometimes. And where uh, would you be? I'm not telling you. <laughs> I didn't tell my wife, and so I'm not, not going to tell. I didn't tell Alan either. No. But uh, yeah, and and and. and Really, the silences between us. Uh, having said, you know, we get on well, we do, really. Uh, uh, but the silences between us was, was resentment. I <laughs> thought, well, uh, all right, you've turned that uh, idea down, come up with one yourself then, or something like that. He wouldn't know what the silence was about <laughs> or anything else, and so the silence would go on for days sometimes. When you started working together, did you make each other laugh? Were you aware of that? I, I can't remember any great... Peals of laughter. No, can you? we never no. we never used to guffle. Right? I think Ray is a radio laughter than I am. I always think you know, it's, it's, it's. I always found it very difficult. Anyway, a difficult uh, craft to do. And I, I think it's you know, far too serious to laugh at. Ray was a dreadful audience. I mean, it, every show we ever did, Hancock and Steptoe, at, at the dress rehearsal, he'd be. Oh, is it terrible? Oh my God! This is the worst thing. I, I mean, I, I oh. start rewriting in the in in the in the in the box. He you know. hated every, and I said the same. It's all right. It's going to be all right. Yeah, you know, when the audience get in, you know, because he looks at him now. I said that's a funny show, and that was a funny. You know, so you didn't think so at the time. But uh, no, there are some people. Who, there are some people who, who are laughers, and yeah. some aren't. I mean, I'm, you know, I appreciate appreciate humour, appreciate funny things. I know it's funny. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Never heard a peep out of me or Alan, you know. No, a peep. smile, a smile. So you're more like a comedian just ticking the jokes? In general, we used to smile a lot, you know. If you come up with a good line, go, yeah, that's good, yeah, you smile. <laughs> but you wouldn't have sort of. Spike would laugh, he would hear Spike laugh, you know, himself, at, at his own work, you know. And we. Can't, we can't, but he was a manic thing. depressive, though, so maybe that's yeah, why. Right, yeah. you know. we, we never used to say, oh, that's a, that's a great line, oh, we can't, you know. We'd be, be, be quietly confident. When we finished a script that we knew wasn't bad, we couldn't wait, you know, the, the wait to get it typed out and, and the first read through. And we'd sit there, I suppose, a little bit smug, thinking, well, you know, wait till they read this, this is going to, you know. But Blood Donor, you knew that that was Blood Donor, you knew, we knew that was going to work, you know. That's, uh, and, and Hancock was a great, talking about laughter, he was a great audience. He used to, you know, he used to, he used to really laugh out loud, you know, if, uh, he, if, he, if something tickled him. So that was so. If we'd written a script that we knew that knew would appeal to him, we used to look forward to to him but seeing it. You know. I've been told by doctors and nurses often that even now they can't get through a day taking blood samples without somebody or more than one person going into the blood donor routine. Now this won't hurt. It will just feel a slight prick on the end of your thumb. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll bid you good day then. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you want any more, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. <laughs> Where are you going? Have me tea and biscuits. <laughs> but you came here to give us some of your blood. Well, you've just had it. <laughs> That's just a smear. It may be just a smear to you, mate, but it's life and death to some poor lips. <laughs> I I've just taken a sample to test. A sample? How much do you want then? Well, a pint, of course. A pint? Have you gone raving mad? <laughs> you must be joking. A pint is a perfectly normal quantity to take. You don't seriously expect me to believe that. I mean, I came in here in all good faith to help me country. I don't mind giving a reasonable amount, but a pint? That's very nearly an armful. <laughs> it was Hancock's uh, bête noire uh, after, after the, uh, the performance of it. He, he, he came to hate it. But at the same time, when he really got... Because uh, everyone would say yeah, to him. Yeah, yeah. Down the street, so nearly an armful, eh, Tony? Yes. He used to hate the one. But also that line, because when sometimes... People sometimes slightly misquote it, almost an armful or whatever. Yeah. But it's the precision, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it's, I'm glad you brought them up, because that's one of the points about we, well, we used to spend so much time. Probably the line started, that's an armful. And then one of us would have said, that's nearly an armful, it's better. And then the other one said, ah, yeah, but better still, very nearly an armful. Because it gets more and more, as you say, precise. But it's it also funny. mysteriously, it is funnier. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But you still get a laugh. You say, and, and a pint, that's an armful. But it's not as, not as good as it's very nearly an armful. And I'll tell you another, another thing that's so important, that any, but is, the, is the, uh, the rhythm of a line. You know, one syllable too many and the laugh's dead. You know, it's gone. You know, you've got too many, you know, too many syllables. Rhythm is perfect. 
And especially when you were working with someone like Hancock, who, who had an in instinct for, for, for the rhythm of a line. It was, it was a, you know, got great value from being very you know, finicky about the construction. Very important. It's not, it's not enough to be funny, it's got to be constructed you know, correctly. The greatest compliment that was ever paid to us, we, we, when we started doing a show called um, um, Comedy Playhouse, we started working with actors. Up until then, we'd been working with comedians or comic, you know, comic, um, character, comic characters, and we started working with straight actors. And we went to a rehearsal once, and one of these actors came up and said, you know, he said, it's, it's very, very uh, interesting working uh, with your scripts because we don't have to rewrite anything. I said, rewrite? How dare they? <laughs> they're, they're peril, you know. But uh, it, it suddenly you made me realise that some writers do, you know, do the script and don't even go to rehearsals. And the actors feel not free... Him, not allowed <laughs> in, And the actors felt free to change the, the construction, change the words, you know, and put it... Uh, well, it never happened to us. We wouldn't, you know, wouldn't allow it. I mean, is the it most is? important part is, 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 is that... That aspect of the writing is the most important part, as far as I'm concerned. But... The thing about, I suppose, the, the, the blood donor, in many respects, from our point of view, was the perfect construction. We, we knew how it was going to finish before we started, which is a great help. Oh, and, uh, and very unusual for us. Very unusual. We never used to know the end. We used to get to page 21, and there's one more page left to do the ending, and, and that'd be another two days to t do the last page. Never knew how to finish. It infuriated me when I first saw Dad's Army, because when they couldn't think of anything to finish, they just used to suddenly have something blow up and then freeze the frame. And I said, that's it, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> freeze frame. Freeze the frame and bring up the credits. But we was, used to spend hours trying to think of an ending. And you're from that generation that you, you grew up uh, leading up to the war and then during yeah, the war. I, I was Presumably that had do. quite an effect, did it? The war in particular, I remember, you know, the, when the, the war, I was nine, when it, when it broke out, nine to 10, 1939, I was just 10, just before the, my 10th birthday. And the very first thing I heard, the, 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 we were listening to uh, Chamberlain saying, you know, <coughs> saying that to no such undertaking have been given, we are now at war with Nazi Germany, and the airway siren went. And I, I was out of the house, around the corner, in the recreation ground, sitting in an air raid shelter, shivering with fear, thinking any minute now I'm going to be blown to smithereens. And you know, sat there. No, nobody else. No, nobody else came in in this air raid shelter. And after about half an hour, the all the all clear went. And I sort of sheep as he went back home. And I said, "Where you been?" I said, I've "Been on the air raid shelter." He said, well, "What do you do that for?" I said, "Because the air raid siren went." You know, so, so my first memory was, and, and I was in fear. I was in, for, the, for the next four and a half years. And when I met Ray, he said, "Oh no," he said, "I loved it." You know, he he, he thought it was a great a great fun. You weren't frightened by the war. Uh, no, I, I, I was. I, I hated the Blitz because they had to go down the down the air raid shelter. I uh, hated all that. Uh, but uh, no, but the, the, the Battle of Britain was okay because we would stand outside and watch it all happen. And of course, the buzz bombs. Well, they, they were all right. They were all right. As long as you remember to. Uh, uh, Get, makes yourself scared once the uh, once the uh, uh, engine stopped. I was going to say, so the note at the, the engine stopped, and yeah. that was when you did. I, I know. I, I, was stand, I, was sta I was standing in our in the middle of our street, watching this doodlebug coming over, and I was with a couple of friends. Oh, I wonder where that's going. And then the engine stopped, and it immediately did that, and it was diving straight for us. Um, we didn't know what to do. We rushed in all directions, and then uh, to his house because that was the nearest. And then everybody in those days used to keep the key on a piece of string through the letterbox. You know, put your hands in the letterbox, pull the string out, and then the key on the end. Get it. And we were trying to do that in order to get through his house to get to the air raid shelter. And there was so much squabbling going on with the key and the piece of string. <laughs> we just threw ourselves on the floor and hoped for the best. And like all bombs and things like that, explosions, they, they always seem much nearer than they are. <laughs> and uh, I think the buzz bomb, when it came down, uh, got, got caught in the uh, uh, electricity pylon. That, you know, so I didn't really leave school because uh, uh, when we were come, uh, coming up to a leaving, uh, it was bomb damaged. So I, I, I didn't go back. And that was it. Never saw me again. <laughs> so. 
but you know, so you never officially left. You just no. They no, bombed the school. Yeah, they, no, nobody <laughs> said anything. Nobody said anything. <laughs> nobody said anything. So yeah. But you both left at sixteen. No, yeah, I, 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 I didn't. I didn't no, 14. Did. fourteen. 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 Yeah, right. fourteen. I, I always remember going to to see the headmaster with my mother, and he, and he said, "Well, now, what does he want to do for?" And my mother said, "He wants to be. Um, he, he wants to be a writer." He wants to be a journalist, that was it. No, he wants to be a journalist. He, I wanted to be a sports journalist because I could see the football matches for nothing. That was the idea, really. I could get in and get the best seat. And he said, uh, she said, he wants to be a, a, a journalist. And he laughed. And he said, I don't know. He said, isn't it amazing? He said, they all want to be something like that. He said, during the war, he said, they all wanted to be Spitfire pilots. He said, I, if I were you, he said, I'd get him a good job in the city. You know, and so where we can. So I, that's exactly what happened. I got a job in the, in the city of London uh, uh, in the shipping insurance agents. I got a job at the uh, uh, transport house in Smith Square, uh, as in the post department. Transport and General Workers Union. Yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful place it was, and it was. It, 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 I, I really enjoyed it there and with the people. And, uh, but I remember coming back one night, as we did. You know, uh, and do the same thing, rush up the stairs of Morden Underground, get on a bus, get on a queue, get on a bus, and everything else. And one night, I, I just stopped. A, a light came down and hit me. I know it's dramatic, but you know, this is the way I remember it. I, and I just stood still on the steps, and I said, I can't keep doing this. I've got, I got you know, there's, there's something else in life other than this. And it was. I got TB and went into sanatorium. Well, that's, that's yeah, the that's point it, yeah. at which you meet. I think it's impossible for people who didn't live through that time to imagine now, but was TB something people actively feared in the way they would now AIDS or avian flu or whatever? Absolutely. I mean, it was the, it was the, the white man's uh, burden, wasn't it? The, you know, the, the, it was a death sentence. Yeah, I mean, the ring yeah. a bell time, you know. Da -da. Like, I, mean, I, I, uh, you know, I was taken ill. My, my mother... I, I was seeing a, a, a girl for, whose father ran a, a, a quite a, a large sweet shop in in, in Wallington, and uh, my mother was working for him part time. And uh, he told her on one side, I'd, I'd been I'd gone into the sanatorium. He said, I think you should realise that when your son comes out of the sanatorium, there's no way that he's going to carry on with my daughter. Which, you know, I mean, that was, that's what it was. It was like leprosy or any, or any, you know, it was a very, very contagious disease, you know. It was before the drugs came on the scene. So it was, I mean, I did, well, Ray will probably tell you, but he was given six weeks to live. Um, and I, you know, I, uh, I thought that the end of, you know, the end of, I was given the last rites the night I had a hemorrhage. Um, so the first thing you knew, was it was blood. With me, it was, yeah, I was, I was yeah. going to work on the bus and I started, you know, coughed up blood. And then I had a, a full hemorrhage that night in bed. And I thought, well, you know, but in actual fact, it was the best thing that could happen because it cleared all the rubbish out and I started healing. As it turned out, I found this out, you know, later. I had every symptom known to mankind except, except for the one thing, blood, nothing. No, no, no Chopin thing at the piano and you know, blood all over the keyboard, nothing like that at all. And, but what, uh, so breathlessness and... I, 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 Sweating, night sweating. Uh, th th I was thin. I was only nine stone four, <laughs> and I was six foot three. Um, uh, sweat, night sweats, uh, tired, terribly tired. You know, uh, no, no energy and cough, and uh, the, all the symptoms except the blood. And and the, the the local GPs, no, 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 uh, just you know, take some malt and uh, cough mixture. And, I say my my life was saved by my brother coming home on leave and uh, and look take took one look at me and got me to the hospital to uh, have an X-ray. And so as you say, this was before antibiotics, drugs. So the only treatment was to go to a sanitarium. Yes, yeah, this, yeah. The, the average stay the average stay was about three years, and that was if you were if you were getting well. Two years was considered to be a you know a spit in the cough. That, you know that, oh, that's you know you can't be kind of been much wrong with him. He's only there for two years. The, uh, and you know, and the was, treatment was what? It was bed rest. Bed rest. Bed yeah. Rest. I, I, was, I was I was the first thing. I, well, I did have the artificial pneumothorax as well, which was the air. So just explain. So but, that was where they, they would collapse your lung deliberately. Yes. Yeah. To try to force yeah. out the TB. But problem. I was also I was on bed rest for a year. I never got out of bed for a year. 
and I remember uh, 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 the first time out, there were about five nurses standing around me and, and holding me up, and the pain <laughs> that was sh shooting up my legs from putting weight on them for the first time. That, that was terrible. But after a short, uh, fairly short space of time, I was transferred to, uh, I was in a two-bedded room with a, and I was transferred to a four-bedded room of which Ray was already ensconced. And another fellow who became a close friend. So there were four of us, and that's where we really met. What was the first thing you said to each other? Do you remember? Oh, no. I, I, probably I, said, he probably said, are you going to eat that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The thing that I've seen photographs of these sanatoriums, the thing that amazed me is everyone smoking. But was that really what happened? <laughs> oh, we had smoking hours. I mean, it's, you know, it's, 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 no all, smoking uh, hours. You can smoke the rest no, of the no, day. No, 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 yeah, it was all it was, you know, two and four. You had to stop. <laughs> <laughs> but all the doctors smoked. Um, nobody knew that. You know, a lot of a lot of uh, people thought it was good for you because it you know made you cough and it opened up the lungs. You know, a bit like taking a, an inhaler. You know. Well, all the adverts were saying how good they yeah, were for you. How good it was for you. And it, it seems amazing talking to you two now in your late 70s about being that close to death uh, 60 years ago. Yeah. Almost. Did, has, it, has it marked you psychologically? Do you feel you escaped? I guess so, yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing is, we, uh, I, I, I can't speak for right here, but with, in my case, I started getting better immediately. Um, after having the hemorrhage, that apparently was the best thing that could have happened to me. From then on, each month went past, and he said, ah, oh, coming along, yeah, better, yes, good. And I also had gone down to nine, just over nine stone. When I, after 13 months, I was weighed, and I was 10 stone four, having put on weight. Within one year, I was 15 stone something. I've got still got stretch marks all over my body, up the inside of my legs, you know, from... When I go, go, the, you know, from the putting on this weight so suddenly, five stone in a year, and I never looked back from that point of view. But yeah, it's funny, when I, after that, when I went to, used to get medical examination, the, 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 the strips off, you could sit here, the doctor and the nurse going, <clears throat> oh, and the, what's all that on your back? They thought I'd been flagellated. You know? <laughs> thought, I'd, what went on in that sanatorium? You know, what, what did that Ray Galton do to you? And, you know, but it was, you know, still got those marks, you know, from... Alan, Alan was convinced that the, the, the only way out, because he was absolutely terrified of surgery, and still is, but for, for anything, uh, that he, he heard it, eat your way out, and, he, and that's, that's exactly what he did. And his poor mother used to bring down food to supplement all the uh, food. <laughs> and uh, anything that we hated in the, in the room and say, oh, I don't want this. Alan said, I'll have it, I'll have it. And it, it, it had all the plates, Ooh, it, it, everything. Oh, good, yeah, lovely. <laughs> he, he was, he, that was it. And the thing that famously changed your life was that you listened to the radio there. Yeah, they, they, they had the radio, the, the radio room, and it broadcast for an hour a day all around the sanatorium, things like competitions, uh, quizzes. Record uh, requests, record mainly. Record requests. A load of records have been bought by the friends of the sanatorium, and you, and the and the girls in the you know in the female block would would and the boys would send messages to each other. You know, they used to meet once a week at the film show, and that and so they were you know a little courting went on, and you know for here's, here's a message for Jean in and it's from Arthur looking forward to seeing you, and it's Frank and Arthur you know this so it was the little mini uh, you know forces favourites type thing. And Ray and I were put, we came onto the radio committee. 18 year old, you know, young kid, represent the young people. And we said one day, it's interesting what we're doing. We were doing um, a seat in the circle, we were doing uh, commentating on um, uh, tennis matches between the doctors and the nurses, pretending we were BBC. And Ray and I said, the one thing we don't do is drama or comedy shows and the bloke and the, who was the head of the thing he said all right then you do it and we said all right then we will so we came up with an idea that we would do six quarter of an hour comedy shows called have you ever wondered and the idea was that they said have you ever wondered what would happen if doctors became patients and patients became doctors you know, and then we'd write a 15 minute sketch and we dried up after four we wrote four and couldn't think of any more so the series uh, was, was, you know, shortened to, to four. 
We got our first fan letter from in the Milford Bulletin. Which and I still have, by the way. We still, yeah, we, yeah. The, 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 so that was the sanatorium newsletter. The yeah. sanatorium yeah. newsletter. Well, we stayed on the radio committee, and we, you know, and it gradually became. I think in the end we finished up with about two hours broadcasting. Little mini BBC, you know, kept us occupied. It's better than embroidering uh, tablecloths, which is what I'd been doing up, up to then. Yeah. He'd been making handbags, because he could sell them. He could get money with the handbags. I think we were raided by customs and excise. <laughs> uh, oh, we, you've been uh, making jewellery down here and things like that, you know, and <laughs> the, the silly it for two shillings and things. Yeah, we, I think we were us some money. <laughs> mad, absolute mad. And right. the way the way you wrote those first four was that pretty much how it and would be later on? Handwritten, yeah. We got the scripts. Yeah. 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 And, and we performed them. them and we performed them ourselves. Oh, and we started there. Terrible. Man. Handwritten, <laughs> and we had a sound effects man, and we had a sound engineer. I think there's a photograph that exists taken in the actual radio room, which was a blanket cupboard. I mean, literally, it was about six foot by two foot. The whole... But it's very good, very good equipment, you know. Anyway, but the, the, that's, how, that's how the writing started. That's how it began. And did you, when you were doing those four, did you think this is something we could do? Not well. I tell you, we must have, we must have had a, a glimmer. A glimmer. <laughs> we must have had the hope of it because we wrote a letter to Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, who were our heroes writing, uh, take it from here, you know, they were the biggest names in the, you know, in, in, in the, the writing best, world, yeah. and the best, they were, you know, wonderful. We wrote this letter, so, you know, to them saying how much we love the show, and, uh, and when we come out of the sanatorium, could, could we get a job in their office? Could we become their tea boys? Um, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be a nuisance, and so perhaps we could get some idea of learning, you know, and they wrote back a charming letter, which basically was giving us the elbow, but in the most charming way. And I said, thanks us for the... Our, and uh, what, you know, that they would uh, hope that we would uh, you know, do extremely well. And the best advice we can give you is to write, send anything you've written to Gail Petrick, the script editor of the BBC, who we know is avid for new writers. Lovely we, have to look up, we have to look that word up for a start. Yeah. <laughs> who we know is Short, avid for new writers. Mysterious. You're yours, Frank Me and Dennis Norton. And we wrote a script which was based on the last sketch of Take It From Here, which used to be a, a pastiche or something with a film or a play or something. You know. And we sent it in, and we got a letter from Gail Pedrick, which we still got, that said, uh, please do not read more into this than appears on the surface, but we were high read your script and we were highly amused by it. Would you bring my secretary and make an appointment to see if we can do something for you? And I, got, the letter was sent to my house, and I, I got on the bus, and I got, went over to Ray's house in, in, in St. Helio, and I got off the bus, and I ran down the, ran down Newhouse Walk, waving this sheet of paper, like Chamberlain arriving back from Munich. Probably yeah, the first time you'd seen him running, was it? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I, the, he doubts uh, whether uh, I ran. <laughs> yes, I doubt, yeah. But the whole he point... He probably we, speeded we up when written, he got it, near the place. And it was written, British Broadcasting Corporation, showed it to all our friends. If nothing had ever happened, we always got this letter to you know, to say that we weren't, we weren't, uh, you know, we weren't a waste of time. You know, we, we were contenders. We, we, were, yeah, we were contenders. <laughs> BBC Television presents. A lot of the people you work with, Tony Hancock's a very good example, but there's also Frankie Howard, Spike Milligan. They encourage this thing that a lot of people want to believe: that comedians are deeply, deeply unhappy underneath, because Hancock gives that impression. I mean, is, is, <clears throat> is, is that inevitable? I don't know if it's inevitable, but I don't think it was true. But one of the reasons that people think of Hancock as being depressed is that that character, which was complicated, wasn't it? Because the character you created for him, which clearly drew from him, was depressive. I mean, there's that fame, the famous episode of the, the Sunday afternoon yes, and many others. Right. Everyone in England was depressed on the Sunday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, the... Um... The, his character was, was, was glue, and he did it so well, you see. All the years that we worked with Tony, nine years, we didn't have any problems at all with, with depression. I, I say, I mean... Although one, he, he was tricky, wasn't he? He was a very nervous man. You know, he, 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 he was... He, he was very nervous. The only thing he could do, he was, he was, and he was brilliant at what he did, but he was very... He, he had a terrible stage fright. Before he ever went... The radio, no, no problem, because he was just reading a script. The big problem was learning lines, and when we used to do a television show for, for a half hour before we went on, he would be, you know, retching, he would be nerves, ner you know. 
until he started, until he got the first laugh, and then he was fine. But as soon as the show was finished, it was a, you know, a drink. You know, and the, the longest, the it longest became walk... more and more to, real, to, re, to rely on the on the booze. That was the problem. The longest walk in the world for Tony uh, was coming, walking out from the wings to the microphone, because that was him. That was him. Then as soon as he got to the microphone, he'd be a character or whatever, you know, and that and that. Then he was fine. But also, famously, you can see in some of those later episodes, because the eye lines aren't quite right, he was, he was relying on an autocue, wasn't he? Was he was relying on... Well, only for the last, two, the last two shows that we ever did with him was The Blood Donor. And that's and, where it started. And, and that, it was on The Blood Donor that he first read the script. That's because, because of um, a motor car he, accident. He was involved in a, a car accident during the, the, the previous week, and he lost two days of rehearsal. Um, he had a slight concussion. And uh, Duncan Wood, who was the director, said, well, we've got two, three choices. Either we postpone the show or we uh, put up the, uh, the, 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 the auto cues for him to read. So it was decided that he should have the auto cues. Um, and that was it. He, he, he never, as far as I know, he never learnt another word. He did everything. His, his rationalisation was all the Americans did it. Bob Hope never learnt a line, you know, the, the, you know. Jack Benny never learnt a line. They all used to read. So if they could do it, he could do it. The point is that the Hancock character is universal, really, isn't it? I mean, you've got you've got miserable sods everywhere in the world, and not just this country. You, know. you want to get rid of him, mate? He's a right drag on you. <laughs> I shall be forced to fill you in in a minute, madam. <laughs> That's it. Go on, it's a lady. Go on, it's a. All right, show me a lady, and I will it her. That way, no, mate. That way, no. <laughs> Nobody to reply to that. Never mind about him. Well, I'll see you tomorrow night then. Well, only if you're by yourself. Get him and we'll all go out together. Okay. <laughs> Shut up. Tomorrow night then, outside the factory. He'll carry your welding equipment home for you. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have to start around? So I had it all sewn up there, money in the bank. Sydney, I'm not going to stand here being insulted by rubbish like that. I have my pride, you know. That's just about all you have got. Something happens every Saturday night. You're all having to spoil it for me. We find a couple of charmers, I go like a bomb and you get up their nose. What do you say to them? My coursing habits are no concern of yours. <laughs> they are when it ruins my night out. I'm telling you, mate, I'm thinking dead seriously of going out of my Todd in future. And he had a cruel streak, didn't he, because he dropped Sid James. That's funny, really, because uh, Sid and Tony were uh, inseparable. Uh, uh, you know, after a show finished, uh, the, the, with their two wives, they would all go out, they'd get out together. It was a, a, a big blow to, uh, uh, to Sid, to Sid. Yeah. but not just professionally, because uh, I don't think Tony, uh, he wouldn't need it professionally, because uh, he had become... But Sid always said, I don't want, I don't want Hancock's job or anybody else like that. He said, I don't want to be a, a top banana. A second banana, suit me fine. I, I don't want to have all these worries and all that. No, no. But at the same time, um, you know, he, he did love being in the show and he loved Tony. And he didn't understand it. He didn't understand well, Tony, the dropping. Tony's rash, you know, reasoning, was, which we agreed with. Well, it really. made sense. It made sense. It made sense. The fact is that they were becoming to be at Laurel and Hardy, you know, Morecambe and Wise. They were becoming a double act, which they weren't. Sid had a career. He used to make ten films a year outside of Hancock's Half Hour. He, was never, he never stopped working. Tony only had the, 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 the show, and, and it was becoming a, a bit of a double act, and he didn't see that his future was a double act, and so he thought he's got to, he's, if he's going to you know, stop it, he's got, he's got to change now. There have been various books and programmes now made about Hancock, and a lot of attention comes down to what caused the breakup, and what, what in your view, did cause it? Well, the, 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 I don't know what caused it actually, but they called a meeting to uh, uh, with us and Beryl Virtue. Uh, Who was at, your agent? Uh, was our agent. She started off as us. Yes, she became a very big agent, and she still is. And uh, it's producing now. And uh, we we met up at that place by Regent's Park, the White House, and uh, he laid out his future plans to us. He was uh, he was going to make this film. Uh, uh, that uh, he, he was going to do it with uh, Philip Oakes. Uh, he was going to set up a film company, uh, which he called, and he's going to take his brother Roger uh, uh, with him. It means that he, uh, Roger was a 
part of our organization, you're going to take him away. And, uh, and uh, so <laughs> that was goodbye. And he said, oh, and, and Beryl, he, you know, he didn't want Beryl to be his agent anymore. So Beryl was in tears and everything else, and uh, um, that was really the end of it. Yes, um, so we, our path never crossed again, or really. So that was the end of that. But it, 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 it was his doing. If we had uh, really stuck together on getting the film subject and getting it right, it could be done. It could have been done. It, it wasn't. He, was, he, he, he knew what he was going to do. But we couldn't wait any longer anyway because we had to earn some money. We went on retainers in those days, and uh, we had to go. So we, the agreement was, we, the, come what may, we would go and write uh, the, uh, some television while he worked on his idea for a film. And maybe we'd get back, and maybe it never happened. Uh, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not surprised. I mean, to me, I mean, it was, it was like a kick in the face. I mean, you, we'd been writing exclusively for him, really, for nine, ten years. And to do that, I just thought, well, that's it, you know. <laughs> so when you, when you came out of that meeting, what, what did you say to each other? I, I, don't, I really don't remember, but... Uh, but you knew that was the end, both of you? Well, I did. Yeah. I did. I mean, I, I thought, well, you know, you go, baby. That's your, uh, your chosen path, you do it. The irony was that the uh, second series of Steptoe, the first night of the second series of Steptoe, coincided with the first night of Tony's new series on ITV. One went out from 8 to 8.30 and the other went out from 8.30 to 9. And in, in the papers, it was all, all, you know, it's a fencing, you know. And as it happened, I mean, Steptoe was, uh, it was a big, you know, killed it. Were you shocked when he died? Not surprised. Not no, so I mean, I, I expected it every day. Every day, every day I picked the paper up, I expect to see, you know, that he topped himself. I really did. Because he's a very proud man, and uh, because he was in such a bad state by then. I mean, he didn't—he didn't manifest anything uh, uh, like this until we all split, and then uh, then I can understand him being miserable because uh, you know there he is, top of the tree, and suddenly nothing's working. Uh, his shows weren't working, and he was you know, taking more of that as, as he was getting more desperate. And he shows will get worse the more he drank. After Hancock's half hour with Tony Hancock, you had an incredible number of ideas at that time because that was one of ten comedies that year. We had to earn some money. So we went to the BBC and Tom Sloan, who was the head of Light Entertainment, said, what do you want to do? So we'd be... Ryan and I had always wanted to do a series with Frankie Howard. Um, we'd work with Frank. We'd work with Frank, but yeah, on, not a series. On, on radio. Not a series. We'd done a couple of radio series with him, you know, um, in, in the early 50s. And he was... Didn't want to know. He said, no, 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 he's finished. This was 1962. He said, he's finished. No, he's, uh, his last series didn't, didn't get any uh, figures. He said, what I want you to do, he said, I've got this um, subject. So this is the, the most remarkable thing ever. He said, well, he, he said uh, I've got a title, Comedy Playhouse. He said, it's my title. He said, but uh, I want you to do ten weeks, right, ten weeks. You can do what you like, I don't care. You can do a sketch show, you can do storylines, you can, you can be in it, you can direct it. You can just give me ten half hours called Comedy Playhouse. Do we like so, it? Remarkable. From, from a guy that we thought was, you know, very, very uh, correct and uh, uh, an army and not really in shape, to come out with a, a, a stroke like this was unbelievable. <laughs> but the, the, we had to say yes. We had to say yes. And, uh, we, uh, well, the idea God. also appealed to us that we could see using actors now. We started using actors with Hancock, more in straight actors, you know, <clears> people like Colin Gordon and, uh, you know, people, you know, were, were, you know and... John Le Miserie really was a straight actor, and, we, we, and he became part of the uh, setup. But uh, the idea of using you know, straight actors to play would, would appeal to us very much. Apart from the fact they wouldn't be counting their lines like the average comic does. You know. Anyway, we got to number four. Couldn't think of a subject for number four. And um, one, you know, we had, we had this little going back to my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had this thing that we. You should do, we, if we couldn't think of anything, we'd come up with outlandish suggestions, you know. Point, you know, two rat catchers in Buckingham Palace, you know, to, just to make ourselves, you know. And Ray won, and he said, two rag and bone men, you know. And I 
thought he was, you know, coming up with one of his jokes, you know, and uh, didn't, one of the silences, I didn't say anything. Say for three days you didn't say anything? Three hours I didn't say anything, and then I suddenly thought to myself, well, that's quite a bit, you know, so, you know, it's a very bizarre background. And so I said, what about those two rag and bone men? And he said, what? You know, he was serious, you know. I found out years later, it was no joke, he'd meant it, you know. <laughs> And so we, st but we still had no idea of who they were, what they were, what the story was going to be. But we were getting to a deadline. We had to start writing. So. They, they were father and son at that stage. Wow. Well, no, we, we hadn't. They, 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 they hadn't at that time. We, we didn't, didn't know, know what they were. They could have been got friends. We halfway or... through, and it wasn't going anywhere. It was quite, you know, we enjoyed enjoyable writing, and you know. And I said, well, you know, to, I said, but what are we going to do? I said, we can't go on like this. We can't write another ten pages of just inconsequential chit-chat, you know. Got to, so we went back over it, and it was obvious that one was older than the other one, came out of the... And the other, you know, he was a bit of an invalid because he stayed at home all day while the other one went out. So we thought, right, one's older, one's younger. What are they, brothers, cousins, you know, business partner? And then the idea came up, father and son, and that was the catalyst. The son was 37 years old and was still at home with his father. And we suddenly saw this, this was a relationship, you know. And uh, we, we finished the, the play with him deciding he's going to go, and he couldn't go because the old man wouldn't let him have the horse. And it, it worked beautifully. And, uh, you know. and then during the writing of it, D Duncan was said, who do you want to play the parts? And we, we said, well, there are two actors. We'd never met, but we admired their work. Harry H. Corbett, Wilfred Bramble. Harry was appearing at uh, Bristol Old Vic. Um, he was doing Henry IV, I think. And uh, it, the, the script was sent to him, and he read it, and he, he persuaded him to let him have a, a week off, and uh, which they gave, and he, he did it. So there he is. He was a, King one week and a rag and bone man the next. Another but, thing uh, about Stepdown Son, which could have changed your lives quite dramatically, is that you never wanted it to be a series at first. No, not at all. But we see, the, the thing the thing is, while we were writing it, we knew it was a series. You know, when we finished it, we knew it was a series. But we didn't want to do it. I mean, ten years of Hancock, I didn't know that. But no, having this, this is this is fine. Suit us down to the ground. Having a in a comedy playhouse. And on the first day of rehearsal, Tom Sloan was down there and uh, looking and smiling. Nudge, nudge, nudge. Uh, well, you know what you've done here, don't you? No? Well, oh, come on, come on. What? What? It's a series, it's a series. No, 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 Tom, no, 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 no. no Never. It's one on its own. No, it's one it's one it's I don't want to do it. No, no. And he, he, he appeared every day, every day, and he took us out to lunch, and he did this and he did that, and we came, uh, all, the, all the objections we could think of a manufacturer, stupid ones as well. And uh, in the end, about six months had gone by, and in the end we said, look, if Harry Corbett and Wilfred Bamble want to do it, we'll do it, thinking two uh, laddie actors, actor laddies, and they wouldn't want to do this for a living. And uh, we couldn't have been more wrong if we tried. Uh, it, it was put to them and they jumped at it. And Ye they jumped at it. Years later, we found, found out that when they were employed to do the, um, the first one, the offer, they were employed under drama rates as straight actors. And they, I think they got paid 90 pounds each, or 90 guineas each for that show. When it comes for, to do a series, it becomes a light entertainment show, and the money in light entertainment is much more for actors than it is for drama. So they were offered about, you know... Probably consider £700 or something like that. Considerably more yeah. money, and of course they leapt at it and never had so much, offered so much money in their lives. That's why they did it. But and that's why what, we did it. And that's why <laughs> we did it. But uh, the point is now, now they said, yes, we, we, our escape route was cut off. And, I mean, it works immediately. That was the beauty of it. We, we did a six-week series. They repeated the first one, and then they did six, six new ones. And Ray and I went off on, on holiday. Ray had taken a villa in Spain. We were going out there to, to work on a film, film script. And I picked up the Daily Mail in, uh, in, 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 in um, Bagnoul-sur-Mer, right on the border of France. And it said you know, about this new series, Steps on Sun, sweeping the country. You know, uh, this is halfway through the series. Harry came out to join us and said, he, it's in, he said, it's ridiculous. He said, I can't move anywhere. 
He said, the, the, the show, uh, that, and the BBC did that. They'd never done before. They repeated it immediately. They followed it on, so it ran for 12 weeks. And at the end of the 12 weeks, it was an enormous success. So, because now we had no, no excuse not doing a second series. And we did four series altogether, you know. Then we had a four-year break, and then we came back for another four. So we did eight series all together. And it was such a hit that I think, isn't it true, that Harold Wilson wanted a transmission time change because he thought it would stop people voting. Yeah, it was in the 64 election, that was. He said that, you know, the Labour Party's traditional support is in the evening and this show is going out at 8.30, well, they won't come out. Was that before or after we invited us to dinner? <laughs> uh, uh, that was, I can't, yeah, well, it was... Anyway, apparently... Um, the BBC refused to change it anyway, and they still got in, so it couldn't have, yeah. I suppose with both Steptoe and Son and Hancock, you were lucky with the look of the actors and the things you could do visually. I, I vividly remember um, in Steptoe the scene where he takes a bath, Wilfred Bramble. Oh, Take yeah. I mean, mind you, we were horrified that he was that skinny. <laughs> Never realised, God, you know, he looked like he come straight out of the sanatorium. Yeah. We, we... <laughs> oh, what a way to live. <laughs> The other interesting thing that well, people have, have commented on, and I suppose there must be some truth, but it's because Ray and I wrote both scripts, and it's ourselves, really, that the Steptoe and Sung you know, were, in a way, an extension of, Sid, of, of Hancock and Sid James, albeit you could get more, you could get into a you know, deeper country that you, with, the, with, with the Steptoe than you could with Hancock. But it was an ex, you know, extension. The attitudes between each other, you know, the... the, the you know, the, the soi disant uh, intellectual as opposed to the thicker who, uh, who, you know, Sid, Sid and the old man were, you know, had no airs and graces, and both Harry and Hancock were living in, the, you know, in, in knew a different world. Knew there was a better life out there, that was it. So there was that, that, that similarity. There. But I think most of the great uh, television comedy in Britain has been about class, hasn't it? And failure. I mean, the, the, yeah. Right. And it's, but it, it's right there, right up to the office, isn't it? Class and failure. But you can't be funny about success, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, I, the big difference in American, American sitcoms and ours is they're all good looking, very rich, very wealthy, you know, uh, uh, and successful. Um, in, in ours, they're all layabouts or, or dodgy dealers. Or, or, you know, duckers and divers. Hopeless dreamers. Dell Boy, Basil Fawlty, all of them. Absolutely. And, and, and the minder, you know, they're all, they're all, you know, a little bit seedy, a little bit this, a little bit that, you know, that, you know. But, you know, I was saying to somebody the other, the other day, say every day, really, you, uh, bad holidays uh, you, you will remember for the rest of your life. And uh, in recounting them, you would tell people, and you start laughing. But you can't gross anybody in. I had a wonderful holiday last year, did you? Oh, you know, be dead in about a, a minute, wouldn't they? But f disaster, disaster is funny, and failure is funny. But also, you see, I mean, Ray and I, to a certain extent, have always written about ourselves in a way. I mean, what we're writing is. I'm not suggesting that, you know, that, 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 that we're putting ourselves into the character. So all these miserable old sods. Yeah, yeah. it's us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Two right old miseries. You've discovered it now. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of laughs in misery. Isn't <laughs> Just a couple of old miserable, miserable old gits. <laughs> you wrote on into the mid-70s, but then you decided to retire. Yeah, I had uh, you know, uh, 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 yeah. What was it, a, a midlife crisis? Yeah, so much, well, you know, it was a bit older, a bit older than me. Yeah, and I suppose, yeah, midlife, it was a midlife. You know, I had other problems with... Uh, I didn't mean to retire. I meant to take a, a year off or so, you know, just and then sort of come back and say, you know, but that's fatal. 
It's a bit like athletes, you know, if you, once you stop, you can't take a year off and then come back. You've, you've, got, you've got to keep going. Because I found I couldn't concentrate. And the one thing you should be able to do when you're writing is concentrate. You've got to cast everything out of your mind. And I couldn't, you know, for 10 minutes and I couldn't, you know, so. Do you regret stopping? I, I, always, I regret having written. I, I used to enjoy having written, but I don't, the act of writing never, never really, too hard. It really is hard. Um, but having written, I used to love it. I used to, couldn't wait to go to rehearsal. Couldn't wait to sit in the rehearsals, but the idea of actually writing it, you know, is, is, I found that. Uh, but see, in some respects, I regret it, yeah. But. Ray, did you feel shocked or betrayed when he decided to retire? Um, I, I could see it coming. I could see it coming, but uh, it's not something I hoped for or wanted. And uh, I think in, uh, in Sweden one night, uh, we were there. Good place to be miserable, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, we stayed up all night uh, drinking and uh, in the hotel room, and uh, I was trying to persuade him not to, not to uh, uh, turn it in, and uh, didn't work. But uh, it, it was it was wrong. But uh, I thought, well, you know, he's got to do what he's got to do, and uh, that man's got to do what he's got to do. So when you say that you could see it coming, you you knew. I knew he wasn't very happy. Uh, the happy bunny at all, yeah. I yeah. have private problems, being private life. But, but uh, yeah. so? I problems know. with my marriage at the time was, you know, so. But I don't think it was just that. I don't think it was just that, because, uh, you know, you could get over those sort of things, and, yeah. you, and you do, <laughs> and you did. <laughs> well, yeah, but, yeah. but anyway, um, I, 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 I didn't want it to happen, and I tried, I tried to persuade him uh, whatever was wrong. Uh, not to worry about it, we carry on and, and it will all come right in the end. But uh, no, that was it, that was it. And in, in the 30 years since, you, you must at times have said, let's get back together. Well, we no. Do. no. No, we haven't, we've no. never dis dis discussed it, but we do get back together occasionally. I see Ray every week, you know, every, sometimes more than once a week. He lives a couple of minutes from me. Most people get irritated by getting older and so on, but I was thinking, looking back to the sanatorium, it's, it's actually, it's amazing that you're here. I know. I keep, I, I, I resent every day that passes. I really do. Um, uh, I see nothing, nothing good about uh, ageing. I see nothing good about old age at all. It's just a waste of time and it's, it's quite worrying, really. Um, but there you are, everybody has to put up with it, unless you're lucky enough to die earlier. But, uh, um, well, some people say that, you know, have a good-looking corpse. Uh, no, it's, 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 it's nothing, to, uh, nothing to hang, but we do hang on to it, and uh, you try and enjoy it at the same time. Better than the alternative. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that famously happens to people as they get older, particularly comedians, comic writers, is they say, oh, that new young lot, they're, they're, no, they're not funny when I watch them on the television. Yeah. Do you suffer from that? I read Philip Roth instead. <laughs> no, I, I think... Uh, I think they were good... I don't believe in golden ages of, you know, it's not, not as good as it used to be. I mean, they were good, they were good and bad in every, every era. You know, a lot of a lot of bad, rotten rubbish was being pumped out when you know thirty forty years ago, but nobody remembers it. And I think there's some wonderful young comedians out there. I think Peter Kay is is is, is brilliant. I you know, like everything he does. Yeah, you know. and he's a young man. God, he's you know not as young as we were when we started, but he's only thirty. I mean, it's thirty two or whatever. What about the office? Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah but uh, I'm glad. Much. I'm glad they. I'm glad they stopped on on series two. I mean, it was there was definitely that was the, definitely the end of it. Yeah, it's one of those. It was, uh, yeah. it, was, it was brilliant, you know, uh, uh, for the first well, for the second series as well. Brilliantly done. Brilliantly done. And finally, if we played Desert Island discs or DVDs, if if there was one you could take with you, it would be the Blood Donor, wouldn't it? That. Or, uh, I, I don't know, maybe... I, would, I like, I don't know, but, but I would prefer a compilation. I would like bits of the blood donor. I would love the, um, I would like the scene, the, the uh, plea to the jury. And, you know, does Magna Carta mean nothing to you? Did she die in vain? That, that speech. And uh, uh, some uh, bits of step toe. A little, if I could have a half hour compilation, I'd, rather than the one complete show. 
Yeah, I think I think so. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm I'm surprised that the lack of egotism in in uh, people who go on that show. Uh, it has happened once or twice where they do pick all their uh, <laughs> records and everything else like that. But most of them don't. Most of them have the good taste not to uh, pick it. But I, I don't think comedy... Well, you cannot tell a joke twice. You can't tell a joke twice. And, I, and if you... It, it's not quite the same, but if you see a show more than a couple of times, I think yeah. it would drive you up the wall, especially comedy. I think, uh, 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 I think that's where the uh, uh, drama has got the edge. I think, I think you can... Get in the mood and watch it again and watch it again and see something else in it or something like that. Whereas I don't think you would try and find something else in a comedy show. You take it as it, as it presents itself to you. And, uh, and I, I think you'd get, well, I would get terribly bored. I'd kill it, I'd throw it in the sea. Uh, and and, and can, I take, can I take an episode of Rab C. Nesbitt with me? You can, yeah. Thank you. Ray Galton and Alan Simpson, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Next week, Mark Lawson meets George Cole. Next tonight, stay tuned for a look behind the scenes of Ray and Alan's creation. The Curse of Steptoe is next. More info in just a second.